Okay, so first, I would like to introduce our moderator for tonight's conversation. Ashley Sweeney lives and writes in Tucson, Arizona and La Conner, Washington. Her first novel, Eliza Waite, won PNWA's Nancy Pearl Award. We were fortunate to host her for her second novel, this one right here, Answer Creek. Um, and we're so grateful that she's here to, to moderate tonight's conversation. Thank you for being here, Ashley. Oh, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. Okay, and then a little bit about our author this evening. Um, she's been called a cross between Dr. Doolittle, Nanny McPhee, and a type A Buddhist. Laurie Buchanan is an active listener, obser observer of details, payer of attention, reader and writer of books, kindness enthusiast, and red licorice aficionado. <laughs> she and her husband live in Boise, Idaho, where she enjoys long walks, bicycling, camping, and photography, because sometimes the best word choice is a picture. We're here tonight to celebrate this book right here, Indelible, a Sean McPherson novel. Please join me in welcoming Laurie Buchanan and Ashley Sweeney. Thank you, Claire. Laurie, it's so good to be with you tonight. I feel like we know each other so well, although we've never met in person, but that will change. Yes, it will. <laughs> So before we talk about how and why you made the switch from nonfiction to fiction and other aspects about your writing life, including your marvelous new release, Indelible, I have to ask you as an almost 40 year resident of Whatcom and Skagit counties and you being from Boise, why Bellingham? That's a great question. And the original location for the Sean McPherson novels was going to be Vancouver, Camas, and Washougal, right along the Columbia River that is the border between Washington State and Oregon. I ran away from home when I was 15. I ran from <laughs> San Diego to up to that area. And I lived there for five years and I know it extremely well. Fast forward to a couple of years ago, I was speaking at Right on the Sound in Edmonds, Washington. Mm -hmm. Beautiful location. And after my commitment, I said to my husband, Len, let's, let's look at this area. Oh my gosh, it's, it's incredible. So I wanted to look at the like 100 mile, uh, you know, radius in that area. When we got to Fairhaven, Bellingham, it was like a mystical, magical thing mm -hmm. happened in the cab of our truck. Mm -hmm. We both felt it at the same time. It was like, do, 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 um, like welcome home. It was oh. like that. The people were and are incredible. Hello. Hi, how are you? You know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. The food, we're foodies. The food there's every ethnicity, every taste, every mm -hmm. thing you could ever want to put in your mouth is there. And not only there, it's delicious. It's so mm -hmm. well presented. But the real kicker was when I saw Bellingham Bay, I knew at, at that exact moment that I was changing the location. Mm -hmm. I totally switched it up and while, while we were there, I took 4,000 photographs and I'm glad I did because, you know, COVID and everything has happened. Um, I, I, we, we went into zillions of places and ate at zillions of restaurants and did zillions of things while we were there, but I'm relying now on those photographs. But it was that, it was that experience and the people that just reached out, we just, you know, walked down the street and it was, you know, um, some locations are not like that. Some locations are not welcoming and people, you know, ha kind of have blinders on and just, you know, mind their own business. But this was, hi, 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 you know, oh, excuse me, or, you know, whatever it was, it was so welcoming. And that's, that's what happened. Well, I'm so glad that Bellingham came through for you. <laughs> Although I know we won't tonight, but I'd love to hear the story about running away from home at 15. Maybe we'll see that in a novel someday. 
So getting back to how, or maybe more importantly and more interesting, why you made the switch from nonfiction to fiction. You have two nonfiction books out already, Note to Self, The Business of Being, and you were on a career path to be writing successful nonfiction. So I'm just interested as a fiction writer, what led you to fiction and are you enjoying it? So I love it. I don't just enjoy it. And I'll get to why in just a minute. I was attending a conference in the Midwest and I was speaking, but as a speaker, you also have the opportunity to sit in the audience and listen to other speakers at, at, at times. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting in the audience and a, an author got up and said, and I'm paraphrasing this, but this is the gist of what she said. I sure hope you like the genre you picked to write in because you're stuck in it. You will oh. write in this genre for the rest of your life. And we mm -hmm. know that people like J.K. Rowling and Stephen King and Neil Gaiman and uh, Anne Rice, they write in multiple genres. Sure. That was such a non-truth. And I thought, and nobody, of course, everybody was so, writers are so well behaved. Um, nobody questioned the person, but in my mind, I'm going, no, no, no. And mm -hmm. I'm the kind of person that if somebody says, no, you can't do that. Yes, you can. <laughs> And if somebody says, you will do this, I might say, no, I won't. So that struck me so hard. It was like a cold glass of water in the face. So for myself, for myself alone, I wanted to see if, if I could. And sure. I, I, I did. And I, I don't just like it. I love it. Um, it is, I love nonfiction as well. Mm -hmm. But nonfiction is comprised of facts. They're tangible, measurable, verifiable. Mm -hmm. um, by trade, I'm a holistic health practitioner. My PhD is in energy medicine. You mm -hmm. know, very clinical, factual, scientific, great. With fiction, that's not the case. Some of the facts exist, and you're working mm -hmm. with some existing things like Fairhaven, Bellingham, mm -hmm. um, the Bellingham Bay. You're working with some facts, San Juan Islands, but you get to be God, and you get to create people, and you get to create situations and sure. locations, and I have fallen in love with being God. Oh. <laughs> Well, I'm with you there as a fiction writer. <laughs> now, your genre is not my go-to genre. And so I was really thrilled when you asked me to blurb for Indelible and to host your, your Bellingham interview. So I had heard you speak earlier at another event about the difference between mystery and suspense and thriller. And I had not known that fact. So I'm hoping that you can enlighten our listeners about the difference between mystery writing and suspense thriller writing. And we'll go from there. Absolutely. So a lot of people use suspense thriller. That's one thing, suspense forward hash sure. thriller and mystery interchangeably and that is actually not true if you were to come to Boise and go into my local indie store it says suspense thriller mystery and that's where my book is but it's two very different things so let me tell you the difference a mystery for the reader the reader does not know who done it until the very end of the book they're at maybe the last turn of the page they're like oh my gosh you know they keep turning the page to find out who done it with a suspense thriller almost from page one you know who the bad guy or gal is you know who that villain is from the get-go and what makes it suspenseful and thrilling is the reader knows but the character in the the characters in the book don't so as you're as you're the reader you're going no don't open the door. No, don't walk in front of the window. No, don't pick up the phone. No, don't put the key in the ignition, whatever it might be. That's what makes it so heart racing is because you know who did it, but the characters don't. So that's the difference. 
You don't have to wait to the end. You know pretty much page one, page two, or you get a pretty good idea that this guy or gal is the villain. And and right. and then you're rooting for the for the other characters to stay alive, stay alive. Right. <laughs> right. Well, you've you've plotted that very nicely with we know from the get-go about Jason and yes. we just want everybody to stay out of his way. Yes. <laughs> so let's get to Sean. Tell us about him. He, he's, he's complicated, but he's endearing. I, I would like to call him a friend. So I'd like to know how you conjured him and how his character grew as you were writing Indelible. So Sean Mick McPherson, his last name is McPherson. So people just shorten it and call him Mick. His first name is actually Sean, but everybody calls him Mick. Right. So Sean McPherson, Mick. I was at a writing retreat off the coast of Washington State, a women's writing retreat. I was there writing my first book, Note to Self, had nothing to do with fiction at all. And in, uh, we had this opportunity, some free time to sit outside. And in the distance, I saw a man pushing a wheelbarrow and he had a, a very pronounced limp. Now that mm. limp, I don't know, did it just happen? Was it permanent? I don't know anything about it, but the man was extraordinarily handsome. So here's a man that I assumed, a, a total assumption on my part, was a, or is a groundskeeper, has mm. some kind of a mobility issue and is drop dead gorgeous. And that back here on the back burner of my mind went simmering and simmering and simmering. And that was the, the beginning of Sean McPherson. Mm -hmm. he, he is a character who has a tremendous weight on yes. his shoulders. Mm -hmm. He has survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. Five years ago, he and his partner, they were police officers, he and his partner, Sam, were on a Friday night, their last night of being police officer partners. Then the weekend would have taken place. And on Monday, they were going to be homicide detectives. They got this promotion together. They were so excited about it. They were almost at the end of their shift. This was in San Francisco. Over the radio comes this call that they said, oh, we got it, we got it, we'll take care of it. So they go to this location which is a, an overpass on a highway. And little did they know they were heading into the crosshairs of a sniper. Now this sniper wasn't after specifically Sean McPherson or Sam. Every morning be, when, when Sam and Mick got together, somebody would draw a straw and that was how they knew who was going to drive that day. Mm -hmm. Sam picked the straw that meant he was the driver. That sniper only wanted to kill a police officer. Could have been a male, could have been a female, black, white, pink, purple, polka dot, it didn't matter. Kill a police officer. What they needed was a call of officer down. Officer down, basically everybody leaves their post and comes there. They needed to empty the station house. There was over $10 million of heroin in the lockup. And they got that $10 million out because Officer Down was called. Mm -hmm. And so Sean has this tremendous weight. Sam had been married. Sam had children. Mick was married. The, his wife divorced him later because he was so hurt in his physical therapy. He, they didn't know if he was going to walk again. She wasn't going to put up with that. And so here he... He thought I should have been the one to die. Mm -hmm. I, I, he was a father. I should have been the one to die. Mm -hmm. This, the growth in Sean is that this thing that was so negative has turned into um, a motivator for justice, not a vigilante type of justice at all, not at all. He is a, a good guy. He wants to do things the right way, but he doesn't want injustice to go unchecked. And so he, he's, he's using this. I don't know that he knows that's what's going on, but he's using this as a motivator 
to seek justice mm -hmm. and to help the, the people who are on the receiving end of negativity. Very timely subject, Laurie. Uh, what's your favorite trait of Sean's? Sean has two things that I call tells. You know, if you play poker um, and you, you look around and, you know, maybe somebody winks or, you know, mm -hmm. rubs their nose or, you know, pulls their ears, something, that's their tell. Sean has two tells. One of them is he, when he's upset or thinking or mulling something over, he, not, not consciously at all, he rubs the outside uh, left side of his thigh. Mm -hmm. That's where he was hurt. And he, he wasn't able to walk for a very long mm -hmm. time. The other thing, as we get a little into more books, um, he, he has, he's a carver. When he was in mm -hmm. physical therapy, that when, once he was hurt, the only part of him that worked were his arms. Nothing else was working. And his surgeon said, you know what? Take up wood carving, take up whittling. Well, he, he started carving and he carves beautiful pendants. He carves uh, canes that have those, you know, those wizards and stuff on mm -hmm. the on the head. He does all of this beautiful work. Women who have long hair who put it up, those, those like almost like chopsticks, those hair things, mm -hmm. he carves these. And well, he wears one that is a whale fluke. He carved it himself. Right. And he's thinking he, he kind of, I, I'll say he fiddles with it. He, mm -hmm. he, he messes with it. And it's a whale fluke. And for him, that has tremendous significance. It, it, the, the symbolism behind a whale is, is um, gentle strength, mm -hmm. underlying peace, mm -hmm. but, but strength. And if it needs to go farther, a whale certainly can, mm -hmm. um, but that's not their first choice. Well, that's interesting because Sean is has both of those characteristics as well. So he, he's a he's a marvelous character. The other characters I absolutely love are Neil and Libby, the caretakers of Pines and Quill, which for those of you who haven't read the book yet, and we won't give you any spoilers about that because it's a great read. I, I really encourage you. I've read it three times now and I've enjoyed it all three times, but I would would love to go to Pines and Quill. I'm sure you'll have readers Googling it to see if they can really go there. But of course, it's a fictional writing retreat. So it's reminiscent of some of the best writing retreats that I have, I have attended. So you've talked a little bit about some that you've attended, but tell us about these wonderfully drawn characters and how Libby and Neil are really the anchor of the story. So Libby is Sean Mick, Mick's sister. She's 15 years older. Sean is about 38. She's in her early 50s. She's married to Neil. Libby is a, a, a writer herself and she helps writers who are there that might be struggling with an issue. But she teaches Tai Chi in the morning on their property. It's a 20 acre property on their property. They have a Tai Chi pavilion and she she's out there very early. And for those writers and residents who want to come join her, it's a kind of a way to prime the pump for writing that day. Right. That's Libby. Neil is an extraordinary cook. And he also not only is knowledgeable about wine, but is passionate about pairing it with the food that he prepares. So writers show up on the first day of each month. Indelible takes place in the month of May. They show up on the first and they leave on the 21st. So they're there for three weeks. It's protected time to write. There are four cottages on the property. One of them is wheelchair friendly. Austin Cottage is wheelchair friendly. There is um, Austin, Bronte, Dickens, and Thoreau, but Austin is the wheelchair friendly one. Mm -hmm. Then there's the main house where the characters come each evening for dinner. They can, they can, they have little kitchens in their cottages. They can do breakfast and lunch themselves, or they can come to the house. It's, it's, that's kind of up for grabs. And then Sean has a cabin on the property. There's a garage, there's a workshop, and then there's this uh, Tai Chi pavilion. So it's a big, it's a big property. And the writers come there to be um, uninterrupted, not derailed in any way. Right. And, 
And in addition to Libby and Neil is Hemingway. Hemingway, <laughs> not the writer Hemingway, but Hemingway the dog. He's a five-year-old Irish wolfhound based on my Willa. Willa is an Irish wolfhound, uh, Old English sheepdog mix. And Hemingway is kind of a little bit of a, um, uh, he's, he's 150 pounds. He's, he, he's, if he loves you, he loves you. But he's not averse to um, taking down somebody if they're hurting somebody that he loves. Right. And he's a huge, huge part of, uh, I got a Kirkus review and one of the things they talked about was Hemingway who without oh, saying words word, send, send, says, a, 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 you know, speaks volumes without saying a word. So I was tickled to think about that. So Hemingway is huge, a huge part of this whole series. Well, food and wine play a major role in the novel as well. And you intimated that your husband is quite um, a chef and a wine connoisseur. So I'm sure that part of his character is infused into Neil's character. Yes, that's absolutely true. My husband, Len, is an extraordinary cook and he also enjoys wine. Um, I'm a very good cook. I don't enjoy cooking. Hmm. He's a very good cook and he enjoys it. So there's a huge difference. Sure. He enjoys putting on his bistro apron, pouring a glass of wine, going into the kitchen and cooking. So if it's time in the book for me to have a breakfast, a lunch, a dinner, an appetizer, a picnic, I'll say, you know, can you give me something? He'll say, well, what what month are we in? What season is it? Mm -hmm. What's growing in Washington State? Mm -hmm. What do they have at the co-op? Um, you know, that type of thing. What's mm -hmm. what's feasible for right now? And then he'll create for me a meal and pair it with a wine. Well, it was mouthwatering just <laughs> reading it. So I really, I really appreciate that. Now you've also got four other characters who are coming to stay at the retreat for the month of May. And I, as an author, it's very important to have those four characters be completely different, but they have to interact, they have to play off of each other, there has to be tension and drama. So how did you come up with these four, one man and three women? And, and my second question is, do any of them have any resemblance to you? Great question. The person who has the closest resemblance to me is Libby. She has the closest resemblance mm -hmm. to me. Neil has the closest resemblance to my husband, Len. Sure. Cynthia, um, Cynthia is an, an, a forensic intuitive. She is there, and, and she also can read poems. She is there for writing a book about palm reading, but she's also just come off of, of a, uh, an investigation where she was involved in, and it involved a child. And it was, it was very emotionally ringing to her. So mm -hmm. she's there too, in part, to kind of cool her jets be before she goes on another investigation. Mm -hmm. she's, she's in the Southwest. She's often called upon by law enforcement agencies. She's very good at what she does. Um, so that is Cynthia. Cynthia most closely resembles in real life, my sister, Julie. Mm -hmm. um, then we have Fran Davies. Fran is um, a person who, had, who is struggling with childbearing issues. Mm -hmm. And because of that, her husband has divorced her. Mm -hmm. Now, this was something that she had no control over, and she, she's heartbroken. So at this point, she's going to control everything that she possibly can. Mm -hmm. Her hair is like helmet hold. Her clothes are exact. Everything mm -hmm. she does is precise and exacting. Mm -hmm. And during her stay, some of that gets shed, and we get to, to watch that with her. Jason. And then there's dear Emma. Emma, 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 Emma. I love Emma. Emma Benton is this month's person who's going to be in Austin Cottage. She's in a wheelchair. She currently has transverse myelitis, which is a form of, of uh, uh, 
like paraplegic from the waist down, she is paralyzed. And um, we don't know if it's going to be permanent. We don't know if it's going to be temporary. Mm -hmm. And I got, I did all of my research with a, a client. She, mm -hmm. she has permanent transverse myelitis. So I was able to, to pick and, and, and glean information. When Sean Mick McPherson mm -hmm. went to the airport to pick up this group of people, he sees Emma and she rolls her wheelchair and it, she just keeps rolling right into his heart. Um, she's an amazing feisty. She's about 35. Mm -hmm. She's the only of, of all these siblings. She's the only girl. She has three brothers. Um, she's from San Diego. She's, she, I love, I love Emma and she's going to be in some continuing uh, books. And then there's Jason. Jason mm -hmm. Hughes is evil personified son of Satan, just unbelievably, unbelievably evil. And he's a psychopath. There's a difference between psychopaths and sociopaths. Psychopaths and sociopaths are both narcissists. Narcissists are, are not necessarily psychopaths or sociopaths. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting right there. Between a psychopath and a sociopath, the one who's most likely going to kill you is a psychopath. A mm -hmm. sociopath is not going to cover their tracks. A psychopath is going to plan, prepare, cover tracks, and so forth. Jason is a psychopath. And you get the word indelible. Each of my books is an I word that is four syllables long. You mean and there's more than one, Laurie? Yes, there's some more books coming out. We'll talk about that. Oh, okay. um, indelible is, is the first book. And you find it, each in the title is the word is used once in the book. And we find out um, that Jason in high school overheard a conversation between his mom and the school psychologist and psychiatrist and the word indelible was used oh. and um, he is just unbelievable he and he we find out in the book that he also killed his mother um he's a twin he's a, a twin not identical I think that's called fraternal twin and um, I won't tell you what or where his his brother is but he's the he's the evil you find that out right from the get-go and um he was fun to write fun to research lots i can't tell you how much research has gone not into sure. this. it's not just make-believe uh but it's make-believe based on a lot of facts especially when you're coming into a career that you did not have in your own life. You were not a police officer or a forensic inspector yeah. or an intuitive. So yeah. this, uh, we could probably go on, you know, for ages about about your research. But I can imagine, Laurie, that it was fascinating to to do yes. that research. You know, in in historical fiction. Even your most evil character has to possess at least one positive trait. Can can you say that Jason possesses one positive trait, or is that something that's not necessary in your genre? It is not necessary, but the one thing that he does extraordinarily well is, um, for the most part, is thinks things through. The, mm -hmm. the man has a plan. The man has good or bad or indifferent. The man has a plan mm -hmm. as most psychopaths do. They are uh, prepared to not even have to cover their tracks because they do things so extraordinarily well. That's the difference. A sociopath is, is, doesn't take that kind of time. A psychopath does. And they have the ability to mimic emotion they have the ability, they, they kind oh. of take cues from what's going on oh. and they are like a chameleon and they, they take that on, but they don't have a sense of, they don't have a, a moral compass. A, 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 a psychopath does not have a moral compass, mm -hmm. but they can pretend and mimic that they do and they can bring you in. We have 
uh, sociopaths and psychopaths as CEOs in in multi billion companies. Oh, have them in, as police officers. No doubt. We have them in uh, mm -hmm. religious institutions. We have them. You might not know who they are. Many times they are people who. Uh, uh, most of the time they look like you know you and I normal everyday people. Many of them lead double lives. Honey, I've got to go away for two weeks. I'm going to be, you know, doing my job here. When they go away for two weeks, if they're at their other family, they mm -hmm. might not be there for two weeks. Somewhere in between, they might be killing somebody. Mm -hmm. And that is what really happens. That's not make believe. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> it takes my breath away to hear, but hear that. That's, but I'm sure that that's true in really in any in any career. It might be not just in CEOs. It might be in education or in medicine. It might be law enforcement, military. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Now, what was it like to write about writers? That that's a fascinating premise. Yes, I belong to five or six writing mm -hmm. groups sure and back in the day we got to get together and now we're virtual like we are this evening mm -hmm. so i get to rub shoulders with lots of men and women writers uh published want to be published both well known mm -hmm. not well known and everything in between and writers like anybody else are very interesting people we all have our own um little idiosyncrasy so you may have noticed that i talk with my hands mm -hmm. um if somebody were to base a character on me that person might talk with their hands mm -hmm. um some people you know have long hair and are you know do do this right. we all have our thing that we do so i am able to draw on you know i like this ingredient from that person and mm -hmm. this ingredient from that person mm -hmm. and this ingredient from that person so i'm going to put those ingredients together and and give birth to this person mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the mystery or suspense thriller authors that you admire and any tips that you've gleaned from them as you've made your debut into this genre. I have three authors that are no longer living who I admire, hold in high esteem on a pedestal as phenomenal storytellers. That's Maeve Binchy. She's an Irish yes. writer. Mm -hmm. That then there is um, Dorothea Benton Frank. She just passed away in 2019, mm. I believe. And then there is Olivia Goldsmith. These mm. people, the First Wives Club, the, the movie First Wives mm -hmm. Club, she wrote the book. They're incredible storytellers. Their mm. writing is excellent too, but they're storytellers. The writers that I admire so much are um, David Baldacci, Robert Dugoni, mm -hmm. Robert Brinza, Keith Hooten, mm -hmm. Hank Philippi Ryan, Hank sure. Philippi Ryan, uh, female. A lot of people think when I say Hank, it's a man, uh, female. They are exquisite writers. And mm -hmm. I think the thing that, that, I would, oh, and oh, Louise Penny, I can't forget. Oh, sure. Chief Inspector Dimash. Oh, my gosh. I can't forget Louise Penny. The thing that they do that just blows me out of the water that I try to emulate is concision, brevity, being succinct, mm -hmm. saying what I need to say in the shortest amount of words, mm -hmm. making those words count, sure. not using filler words but using few words that really pack a punch. Well, it seems like you've been a good student of, of those authors, Laurie, because really in, indelible just, it moves right along and not just the setting and the characters, the dialogue. It's just, it's a delicious novel. I just, I, I really enjoyed it. So. Uh, piggybacking on your last um, answer, what is the best writing advice that you've ever gotten? And what's the best money that you've ever invested in yourself as an author? 
the best writing advice is to read, 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 not to copy anybody, but just to broaden your horizons, not just read in the genre that you write in. I'm on my 34th book this year. For some, that's a lot of books. For some, you know, they're on their 100th book. But I, I consider myself a voracious reader. I always have been. I've been, uh, up until the time True. I was seven, my mom read to me. And then at the age seven, I just, you know, and if I did something wrong and they put me on restriction, I was like, oh, no problem. I would just go to my room and read. Um, <laughs> so there was no, no punishment there. Um, so reading, I think, is I, I consider that part of my job description. Good. Um, the best money that I've ever spent as a writer is writing conferences, mm -hmm. writing retreats, mm -hmm. and I have had the same writing coach, Christine DeSmet, since this book here, mm. Note to Self. Christine DeSmet is uh, amazing. And to have a writing coach. So let me tell you what a writing coach for those listening who I know you know what that is. It's somebody who's going to tell you the truth. So if you have your sister read something or your mom read something or your best friend read something, they're going to say, oh my gosh, Lori, this is just the best thing since peanut butter. And that may not be true. Um, Christine tells me, oh, oh, Lori, this blows chunks. <laughs> or Lori, you hit it. You, you nailed it. Or, or somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. She's, I can count on her. We are not friends. We are kind of a professional relationship. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be buddy, buddy, close friends because then I would lose that with her. She mm -hmm. might think that she will hurt my feelings. I'm paying her to right. tell me the truth. Right. And we don't necessarily, not that, not that our friends and family are liars, but they don't want to hurt our feelings typically. Right. Right. So, so that is probably my, my best money spent is, is mm -hmm. being a coach, uh, have, hiring a coach who will tell me the truth. Yes. Do you send out to beta readers, uh, early readers at all? After, after Christine has done her thing, I send it to my sister. My sister's the next person who will um, tell me the truth. She is, uh, she sees things that, that I don't see. She'll say, she'll say, um, what's an example? You know, in today's uh, uh, environment, Lori, maybe you shouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. Or in today's environment, maybe you should address this. Right. Um, she, she'll do that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Well, I have just two more questions before we go to our readers for their questions. But you intimated that there might be a second or a third or a fourth book. So, so tell us, tell us. Yes, I will tell you. So book one just came out, uh, Indelible came out on April 6th, 2021. Iconoclast comes out May 3rd, 2022. Oh, Impervious nice. comes out spring 2023. <gasps> Iniquity comes out spring 2024. And so right now, that's where my publisher, our publisher, has contracted me through is four books. But if I had my druthers and if I my dreams come true, I will be somewhat like a Louise Penny, who I think her 17th book just came out, Chief Inspector Gamache. And as long as there is a um, demand, I intend to supply it. I intend to meet it. So that's, that's, you know, pie in the sky. That's my dream. Well, that's very exciting though, Laurie. And it's exciting not only for you, but for readers, because you, without giving anything away, you have left us wanting more at the end of Indelible. So, so what is the name of the next one? The next one is Iconoclast. Iconoclast. And, okay. and then Impervious and then Iniquity. Okay. Well, I'll be 
at Village Books, pre-ordering that book as soon as I'm able to. So my last question for you before we go to the, the questions from readers is, is there anything that I haven't asked you tonight that you'd like to share with readers? I know we didn't get to all of the questions we had hoped to. So is there any that you would like to address before we turn it over? I think the most important thing that perhaps readers aren't aware of, but authors are painfully aware of, is the fact that we need to have reviews, oh, good, yes. bad, or interesting reviews. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, when some people, you know, they'll say, oh, Lori, I read your book and I loved it. And I'll say, oh, would you say that in a review? And they, they mm -hmm. are like, no. And I think they immediately go to a, like a book report in high school. <laughs> It doesn't have to be that. It can be, I like this book, period, end of story. Mm -hmm. uh, or I love this book, I like this book, or I didn't like this book. It's, it's the number of reviews, honest reviews. Mm -hmm. It's the number of reviews that, that runs an um, algorithm behind the scenes. And that algorithm, the more reviews you have, the more likely your book is going to be shown on the side if you're looking for a book online it's going to show so it 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 it, it is imperative it is truly an author's lifeblood well, and one thing that readers don't realize is they don't have to use their own name when they write a review. They can no. be Northwest Reader or Seagal or, you know, Book Lover too or something. So that that's always nice to know for you readers that you're welcome to put your name on your review, but you can use an alias on reviews and 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 be more anonymous about it. So, well, I'm gonna turn it over to Claire and she's going to take some questions from, from the readers tonight. Well, this has been so fun to listen to. Um, and so everybody, um, I have opened the chat up again. Please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A or uh, pop them in the chat. Um, let's see, it looks like uh, Kay would like to know, um, how or why did you choose a disabled woman as the heroine potential victim? I think that, and this is just my, my reading experience speaks to the fact that people have, who have mobility issues aren't represented mm -hmm. very much or very well in writing. My grandfather was a double amputee um, he was not in a wheelchair. He used prosthetics. This was back in the day. He had aluminum legs. Mm -hmm. He was also blind. We're going to have a, a blind person in um, impervious. Um, and I know a lot about blindness. My mother was born with spinal bifida. She contracted polio when she mm -hmm. was seven. One of her legs was six inches shorter than the other. She had her heel cord lengthened. It's so important to have representation and that means a lot to me. I appreciate that. That's, that's an excellent answer. Um, Kizzy would like to know, do you still treat yourself to flesh, fresh flowers regularly? She I says do. you're su looking, such a good role model for her. She says. I'm looking at um, red and yellow tulips as we speak, mm -hmm. Kizzy. Thank you both and Kay as well. I do. I love fresh flowers. It's something that I, as a minimalist, I don't have things. I don't have stuff. Uh, I just don't. And um, one of the things that I do have is a, a vase with fresh flowers. Mm -hmm. We have a place um, I can walk to it called Roosevelt Market. Just around the corner, I can get a cup of coffee and walk home with fresh flowers. Mm -hmm. Nice. I am one of those people too, like where I feel like if I had $5 left to my name, I might buy flowers with them. <laughs> or chocolate. <laughs> or ch yes. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Cheryl would like to know, um, she says, I love the nature elements in the story. When did you first learn about bats? Bats came into my life really early. Um, my parents, my mom was 17 when she married my dad, 18 when she had my sister, 19 when she had me. So they were kids having kids. So kids were raising kids. And 
Uh, my dad would take us panning for gold. He, I mean, we would be out in the hills. We would be camping. My dad was a pilot, like my husband is a pilot. We would go to Las Vegas. We would, you know, just because we were in San Diego, Escondido, actually. We lived in Escondido, and there was a place called Eagle's Peak that had a bat cave. And my dad would take us up there and we would go into the bat cave. We'd have baseball caps on because this was back when people thought that bats got in your hair. And that, that's actually not true. Um, but we would go in there and we would have our flashlights and we would look at the bats and we, they'd come flying out. So bats have been a part of my, bats are good. We need bats. We need bats tremendously. And the, uh, Washington State has the big eared bats. That's a real thing. And there's really the bat caves there. And um, that's important. That's part of that's part of the story. Okay, very cool, um, Janice. This is more of a, a, a comment, and I have to agree with her completely. She says, Laurie, I'm so happy you got a warm welcome from Bellingham. We've lived here 38 years, coming from Escondido. Um, Escondido. Yeah, and then and then I th I don't know if these are initials or I'm afraid I don't know what she means here. O G H S and S B H. Oh, those high schools. Okay. okay. So people know I ran away. Yeah. I mean, everybody knows I ran away. Um, we won't go into that tonight, but O G H S Orange Glen High School. So I don't know if, if am I maybe speaking to Joyce last initial P when we were in high school? No, Janice. Oh, Janice. Janice. Okay. Okay. So um, I lived in the Flower Streets. Uh, on Goldenrod, Escondido has some flower streets. Oh my gosh! Are you? So she says her her name is Janice Johnson Oatkin. Oh my gosh! Well, hello. <laughs> <laughs> and I came to Bell. I was so thrilled to hear you speak highly of Bellingham too, because I know exactly what you mean. When I moved out here, I came from across the country. I had no idea what to expect. I did. I had seen pictures of the Seattle area and it may as well have been like another country for me and I drove into Bellingham and just went whoa you know and that was 1994 and here I am still so um it it, it it's a special place and I'm so glad that I'm so glad that you featured it in this book yes. um I have a question for you about writing psychopaths um how because I've, I've, I've talked about this with other authors who write thrillers or mysteries. When you're writing, when you're in the head of Jason, of your psychopath, how do you exercise him when you're done read, when you're mm -hmm. done writing him for, 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 for the day? Like, you know, you're, you're yeah. not done with him, but when, when you're in the mind of a psychopath, that seems like it'd be a pretty dark and gross and scary place to be that you kind of have to inhabit. How do you purge him when you're done? And I call it cleansing my mental palate. Yes. So I'm a huge walker. Um, I walk six miles a day. I walk, I do it in two miles, two miles, and two miles. So before I start writing, I walk two miles. I write two hours. I walk two miles. I write two hours and I walk two miles. And I take tons mm. of photographs. Uh, people who follow me on Instagram know that I take tons of photographs. That helps me to cleanse my mental palate. It mm. is a scary place to be in, to be Jason and to think about what he could do. Or as we go into further books and I won't say some other people and, and to, to walk a mile in those shoes and to be able to do something so horrific. One of the things that my sister said and she said, Lori, it kind of scares me that this is coming to you so easy. And, you know, when, when you stay with me, do I need to lock my bedroom door at night? You know, <laughs> that kind of a thing. Um, but it is, it, it is, it's fascinating. And so you can, you can eat up the research. It, living in Idaho, I'm part of the Idaho Writers Guild. Each month we have a mystery academy. And I get to talk with, I get to go to the cram lab. I get to have write-alongs. I get to talk to forensic mm -hmm. experts. I'm to, when you, if you look at the acknowledgements in the back, I thank the forensic specialists who not only did I talk to at the academy, but then made appointments with later. So it's, it's based on, there, there's nothing bogus about, about this at all. And so I, I get to get in that, but the, the walking cleanses that mental palate. I live... 
a stone's throw from the Boise River, and we have something called the Green Belt. It's 33 miles long, uh, no cars, it's bicycles, pedestrians, skateboards, that type of thing. And I can just, I'll, I'll put my earbuds in. I always have one book going and then one audio book going. And that's what I listen to when I'm just trudging along and taking a picture and trudging along and taking a picture. Okay. How about you, Ashley? Because you you go to some pretty dark places in your books too, sometimes. I do. Um, unlike Laurie, I sit for the majority of the day in in my work. And then that, that was a, a neat concept, a mental um, cleanse. That's, um, I just have to go outside. I have to just get up and go out into my beautiful garden. Gardening is one of my other loves. I'm also an art quilter. And oh, so nice. I can go either on a beautiful day, I can go to the garden and on an inclement day, I can go to my sewing room. And it's very therapeutic. Both of those things are very therapeutic. I, I do not enjoy cooking. I think after cooking for four children for many years, three meals a day. I've, I've kind of lost the love of cooking, but, uh, but going out into the garden or going to the sewing room is the way that I can decompress. Good. It's so important yeah. to have that when you, when both of you, when, when, when you have to inhabit, you know, that mm -hmm. space pretty intensely in your brain. Mm -hmm. um, that's good that you have those, those outlets. Um, and so I just put in the chat the link to the Village Books webpage where you can purchase a copy. One-stop shopping at Village Books, you can purchase a copy of Indelible and Answer Creek. Yes. I mean, what better, what better thing? <laughs> um, so we do have a couple more minutes if anyone has any last minute questions or if you ladies have any final thoughts for us. Sure. Well, I'm always thankful. You go ahead, Lori. I just was going to say the same thing as you. Thank you. Thank you for hosting this event. Thank you for staying in business. This is a hard time to be in business. This is, you know, indie bookstores. If you, if anybody who's watching this, if you can support your local indie bookstore, this is huge. This is so huge. We want bookstores to be around for our children and our grandchildren. I'm a grandma. I have a two and a half year old granddaughter. I just took her a, a, a fish today. Um, she's so excited. And, and she's a lover of books. My son is a lover of books. Um, we, we need to have people who read and, and this broadens our horizon. You know, during COVID when we were stuck at home, we got to travel by reading. And I thought, what? how cool would it be if we got to have our passports stamped based on our reading, my passport <laughs> would be amazing. <laughs> Mine too. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. And I too am very thankful for Village Books. It's been my bookstore for the almost the entire time I've been in Whatcom and Skagit County. So thank thanks to Claire and to Village Books for hosting. And I look forward to the day, Laurie, when you come to Bellingham again and we can have a cup of coffee at Village Books and Claire can stop by and maybe some of our readers will stop by and we'll get back to some some sense of normalcy in the in the bookstore world. Looking well, and we oh I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm just looking, looking forward to that. Yeah. Well, to on on to a perfect um, connection to that, Janice posted one final question and wants to know if when you can come back in person, will you come to Bellingham for your next book that comes out? So, and that actually yeah. would be my question from Village Books to both of you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I will be there. I will let people know when the next book's coming out, see if we can make arrangements for an in-person event like this, but in person, mm -hmm. absolutely. I'm not, I'm not done with Fairhaven Bellingham. <laughs> Izzy says it's a date and actually real quick, what are you, what's your next, what's your next project? 
Well, my next project is called Jericho. It's set in 1905 rural Arizona territory. And I guess I can go live with this news. I haven't gone live with it, but I do have a contract and it will be out next fall. So, so I'll be there too. I'll be back to Village Books for my third novel. Yay! Yeah. Oh, this is very exciting for both of you. Gosh, congratulations to you both. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight and from parts, parts all over. Um, and the, I just, this was great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you all. All right, with that, I think we will say good night. Good night. Good night.